Hello and welcome to this workshop, Data Wrangling for Graduate Students. My name is Molly Webb. I am a GIS and data developer on the data services team at University Libraries. Speaking of my team, data services, as I mentioned, we are part of the University Libraries, offering data-related expertise and services to the WashU community across both campuses. Our target areas include the management, sharing, curation, wrangling, data literacy, and visualization of all kinds of data, as well as support for GIS or geographic information systems. A quick intro to my team. We're led by Jennifer Moore, and I also have my colleagues, Sarah Swans, who's our digital humanities librarian and data curator, and Bill Winston, who is our GIS and data visualization analyst. If you are coming to us from the medical campus, I definitely recommend getting to know our colleagues on in Becker in the research computing and data management and sharing teams at the Becker Medical Library. They offer a set of services and expertise tailored for the School of Medicine's unique needs. All of these folks are here to assist you manage your way through the data lifecycle, which runs alongside the research lifecycle. Specific to our session today, we are going to be focusing on this portion of the data lifecycle, targeting data exploration. We're going to be um, essentially preparing our data for analysis, which we're referring to as wrangling here but it can also be called data cleaning, data scrubbing, or any number of different names. All of it is to prepare for the next step, which is analysis. And you may even have to go back and forth between these steps several times. Analysis can mean many things, and it's going to be unique to your own field of study. In this workshop, we're going to be focused on data that can be read as text by a computer, although data doesn't necessarily have to be on a computer. Really, data is information that can be stored in a structured or standardized format. But most of the time when we are wrangling data, it is on the computer and also uh, not necessarily in a format that is nice to look at. For example, <clears throat> the table on the left would be really nice for a glossy report or publication, but the separate tables, formatting, and special characters in the cells could cause problems if you're wanting to analyze these values. Typically, you would want to strip any formatting as a first step to preparing your data for cleaning. We want to make sure that we're working with only the values in our data so it's in a format that the computer can work with. We can see that our little computer friend here in the lower right loves the table on the right because it has no formatting and it can read the values properly. Same with data that isn't necessarily in a table. It may be big chunks of text, entire books, or entire collections of books. The layout on the left, again, has a really nice presentation, but there's a lot of formatting and extra elements like bullet points and the image. All of these might get in the way when it is time to actually do the analysis on our data. The computer likes something a little bit more along the lines of the text on the right. All of the formatting has been stripped away, leaving just the text for the computer to read. <clears throat> Since we know that we're going to get rid of any formatting, this also means that we don't want um, any of the meaning of our data to get lost when the formatting goes away. For example, using color to indicate a particular value or state of the data. This table here shows a list of people and jobs with a color shading to represent the employee's status as a current or former employee. If we were to strip this color shading, the information about the employee's status would go would be lost. So instead, <clears throat> make sure all of the information is represented as an actual value. Here, we've transferred all of the values from green and red to a new column called status. Now it's easier to sort or filter for the current and former employees. 
the same strategy applies for strike through. This is also not likely to be recognized by the computer, so we'll do a similar action and we'll transfer all of this information to a status column to hold the actual data values. Another tip, primarily when working with applications like Excel, Apple Numbers, or Google Sheets, is to avoid the merging and splitting of cells. Again, this can be fine when creating a table that needs to look nice, but for analysis, we want all of these values to have our own cell. So the combinate, or excuse me, the column on the left has been merged to indicate the location of a particular employee. We can break that out um, into um, their own values and repeat them across the records. For the employee that has a uh, two roles and indicating um, indicated by this split cell, we can include a duplicate record for that employee to cover their additional roles. Now, this changes the nature of our table slightly in that now each rep record represents a role or um, excuse me, each record, record re represents a role instead of each record representing an employee. So this leads me to another point. Ideally, before you start cleaning, or at least at some point during the process, you need to have an idea of what you need the data table to look like before you are done. This again can depend on the types of analysis strategy you are undertaking or even the application that you're going to be using for your analysis. Some examples of this include he this one here. Um, these are analyzed soil samples from various sites. Now, do you want each record in the table to be a unique site? This table is set up this way, and it also includes uh, a location informa uh, information, latitude, longitude, as well as the results of the sample that was analyzed. But if your study requires gathering multiple samples from each site, then perhaps something like this uh, would be more appropriate here, um, where every record is a sample taken at the site, so we have a unique sample ID, the site ID is repeated, and then there's information about each sample taken, what data was taken, who took it, and then the location and the analysis taken on the sample. A few more examples of this kind of question that you need to ask yourself include, would you like your table to, or do you need your table to have one record per patient, or is every record a clinical visit by a patient? Do you want a table of cases by case number, or do you need a table of services received where multiple services could be applied to an individual case? Should your records be all authors, or do you need a list of publications that can be more than one author? And maybe you might need both types of tables. As a rule of thumb, I like to use the smallest unit possible or the most granular level of data because you can always aggregate it or summarize it later. So this author publication example brings me to another point on data structure, and this is the concept of wide versus tall data. And this is as intuitive as it sounds. So wide data is structured to have a higher number of columns, and typical, typically every record has a unique value for its first column. Here we have a sample table where each record is a fictitious author with their publication titles listed out in individual columns. This is fine for data that has a finite number of columns, but what if an author has 100 pop publications? This table would need additional columns, over 100 of them, added to accommodate this information. So this brings us to the flip side, which is tall data. So in this table here, we're showing the same values, but this table has one record per publication and the author combination um, and holds a unique ID for each of those unique combinations. It repeats the author ID values that could be linked back to a different table that is just authors. 
So some applications call for wide data and others call for tall data. It just depends on what information you need to keep together. Sometimes you're going to have to flip back, back and forth. And many data wrangling applications have functionality that allow you to do this without huge amounts of effort. Getting your data to this place can be time and labor intensive, as I'm sure you're aware, or else you wouldn't be here at this workshop. So all the more reason to have an idea of what you need your data to look at, to look like before you really dig in. So like I said before, you may have to go through many iterations of data collection, wrangling, and analysis before, you're, before it's all said and done. Generally after collection, we wanna go through a state of technically correct data. And then after some additional cleaning, we have consistent data so we can move on to our analysis. So what do I mean by technically correct data and consistent data? So technically correct data is data that can be read or analyzed by a computer. Ideally, each observation is in its own row and each variable is in its own column. The computer recognizes the correct data types and there are no extraneous symbols, spaces, or special characters that might mess something up. Another thing to remember is that rows and columns should be independent from one another, meaning that if you switch around the order of the columns or sort and filter out the rows, it's not going to impact the integrity of your data. So once we get through the steps of making our data technically correct, then we want to go through some checks and make sure that the data is consistent and ready for analysis. We wanna make sure that all of the values make sense. And if not, we need to decide what to do with them. Do we want to exclude values that are way off from the rest? Or do we wanna include them as outliers? Do the relationships between the variables make sense? And again, there may be some back and forth here once we actually start analyzing our data. So all that being said, this brings me to the demo portion of this workshop which I have named the Data Wrangling Platform Buffet. I'm gonna go through a few different platforms and perform some of the common data cleaning tasks that you might do to get started, including reading your data in from a file, checking the structure of the data, working with data types, exploring the data values, making corrections and adjustments, and then maybe exporting out to another file. So I've selected three platforms to demo, and none of them are Excel, Apple Numbers, or Google Sheets. Now, those applications are great, and they can be really handy for taking a quick look at your data. But when you make changes to your data in these platforms, the steps that you have taken are not necessarily recorded or documented in a meaningful way. And it may be diff difficult to remember later and hard to reproduce. And we know that when we're doing research, documentation and re reproducibility are very important. So the first platform I'm gonna take a look at is OpenRefine, which is available for download for free at this link here. OpenRefine runs locally through your web browser, even though it's not connected to the internet. It can read many, many different types of data and combining files is also really easy in OpenRefine. And um, it doesn't alter the original data. It kind of holds everything in memory and then you can export out the clean data. And most importantly, the cleaning steps are recorded. Um, so I'm gonna be focusing on the open refine portion and hopefully getting through all of the items that I wanted to get through with open refine. Then the other two platforms, um, I have kind of ready-made um, demonstrations for you, should we not be able to get through them all together. So the second platform I'm going to take a look at is Pandas, which is a Python library. Yes, Python, but uh, you don't need to know a whole lot of code to get pretty far with data cleaning with these libraries. Um, so for pandas um, you in Python, you can run it in the command line, you can run it in an integrated in de development environment or IDE, and you can also run it in a notebook like Jupyter Notebooks or Google Collab Notebooks, which is what we're going to be using, and those are web-based. 
The second uh, code based example I'm going to be going through is our studio desktop, which is an IDE for the R programming language. And it's created by a company formerly called R Studio, but now is called Posit. And um, it has a lot of the same advantages that working with Python does. It doesn't, uh, it reads a ton of different data formats. It doesn't alter the original data. It works within data frames in memory for your computer. And the code is naturally self-documenting. So as I mentioned, during my workshop, I'm going to be um, focusing on Open and Refine and trying to get through that application because it's a GUI and I'm gonna be pointing and clicking and actually like doing um, changes interactively. I've also provided a link to the Google Collab notebook with the Python code and the POSIT Cloud notebook with the R code. So if I don't make it through all of these today, you can go through this link and um, the code has markup that will walk you through all of the steps. Now, um, I'm going to switch over to OpenRefine. And first, um, we're going to take a look at the sample data we're going to be working with today. So <clears throat> this is just a standard spreadsheet. Um, I have opened it up in Excel just to take a look. It has approximately 1,000 records of some fictitious survey responses where um, the responders gave their city, state, zip code, an income value, and uh, we also recorded the date submitted. So we tried to hit all of the major data types here. I'm gonna minimize this. I'm also gonna turn on a little uh, cursor highlighter. So hopefully you can see where my cursor is a little bit easier. Okay, so this is the Open Refine application. I downloaded this. Um, at, like I mentioned, it's a free download, and we can see that it's running in my web browser. Um, let's see. I'm just using Chrome here, which is my default web browser. All right, so I've got my Open Refine window. And it's giving me the option to create a new project, open an existing one, or import uh, an existing project. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to click choose files and I could either um, open this file locally from my machine. That's definitely an option. And that's probably a pretty common one that you might be going through in your own work. Or um, I could, I'm going to cancel out of this, or I could access data that is hosted on the web using a web address or a URL. So let's go ahead and give that a try. I'm going to go back to my presentation so I can get a direct link to my, um, to my data here. And I'm just going to copy the link, go back to Open Refine, and paste that link into the web URL uh, slot. I'm gonna hit next. And something to keep in mind with that link is that um, at least for Google Drive, it's not the sharing link, it's the download link. Um, so it's a little bit different than the link that you would uh, choose if you're going to share that data out. So the we successfully were able to read the data in and before we bring it into the project, it's going to give us some options in terms of how we want to parse out this data. It recognized that this is a CSV or essentially a separated um, file. It's giving me the option to, um, to trim any white space or leading space um, right from the get-go if we want. So that's pretty handy. It's giving us the option to insert different column names if we want to give the data different column names while we're working with it. Um, it's also going to give us the option to take a first stab at trying to figure out the data types of this data by attempting to parse cell text into numbers. So I think I'll go ahead and I will just um, have it do that straight away. 
<clears throat> and there are some other options here that will just kind of help us get that data into the shape that we need without too much work. So once we're ready to actually create this project, I'm going to give it a name. I'll call mine STL survey for workshop. We can add some tags to it if we want, and then I'm gonna create the project. Okay, so when we bring it in, it immediately tells us how many rows we have. We're only seeing the first 10 rows right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, adjust this to show 1000 rows since my data is just over 1000 rows. You can hit next and last and previous to go through the different pages if you want. We've got um, all of our columns coming in. And also if we um, use our little drop downs, this is how we can actually perform the work of adjusting these values. All right, if we wanna look at the data type here, um, we'll just try case number. I'm gonna click on the drop down next to case number and I'm going to go to edit column, join columns. And this, uh, if you have say a data set that has many, many, many columns that go off this page, this is a good way of um, seeing what columns you have. And then it also lets you select or deselect and reorder them if you want to order them around in a way that makes com that's comfortable for you. There's other options that you can do like replacing nulls and um, adjust the column to make a new column and things like that. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to um, check out our data types. All right, so we're gonna start by looking at um, case number again, and we're going to go to um, the column dropdown. We're gonna go to edit cells, common transformations, and then this gives us a lot of really easy steps that we can take to change the data type. So we can see that when we instructed OpenRefine to recognize the data types, it recognized case number as a number, which technically it is, but case number is not something we're gonna be working with as a number. It's really just an identifier for our response. So we don't need those to be numbers or treated like numbers. So I'm gonna go ahead and use the common transforms um, methods to transform this back to text. All right, so uh, it transformed that back to text. It gives us a little message here that said that it, trans, uh, it transformed all 1,068 cells. And, um, and then it looks good. We're ready to move on to the next. Same thing with zip code. So it saw that all of our zip code numbers were coming in as digits. And so it thinks, okay, this is a digit. So I want to um, mark it as such. Zip codes technically are not really numbers. They're more like categories. And we're not going to be treating this as numbers. We're not gonna be doing any math with these numbers. So I'm gonna go ahead and do the same thing. I'm going to click on the dropdown. I'm gonna say edit cells, common transforms. And then we're going to again say to text, okay. Got a little message here that everything worked fine. So since we've made a couple of changes here, I'm gonna show you where all of those changes are recorded. So if we go to the undo redo section over here, it gives us a step-by-step -step list of all the changes that we've done on this data set so far. And um, if we want, we can hit extract. And so um, essentially it's recording all of these steps in a JSON file. And so we can export this JSON file, which will be our record of all of the transformations that we did on this data set. Okay, so let me take a last look at my data types and everything looks good for now. 
We are still going to take a look at these dates here, um, but we'll do that in just a little bit. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at our unique values. All right. So um, if you're if you've been in St. Louis for any amount of time, you know that if you ask someone to give give you their city and they're from St. Louis, there are many, many different ways of listing the word St. Louis. Uh, you could have ST space Lewis. You can have Saint written out. Um, and so on and so forth. You could have ST period Lewis. Um, so often um, if you allow your recipients or your respondents to give a free text answer, you're going to get a lot of different answers that are going to need to be cleaned. So most of the time you'd wanna to try to avoid that by putting some kind of data validation in your data collection mechanism. But let's say that we didn't do that in this case. So what we're going to do is we're going to click on the uh, drop down next to city. And this time we're going to go to facet and then we're going to go to text facet. So what this does is it goes through and it finds all of the unique values within the city column. And we can see that we've got our three right now. We have three different ways of referring to the city of St. Louis. We also have a couple of different ways of referring to University City or U City. And then we also have um, something that looks a little out of place. We have the city as Mo, N M O, um, which is a state, not a city. And so we may need to do some work to correct that as well. So let's take care of the St. Louis and U City uh, items first. And we're going to do this by using clustering. So I'm going to just click on this cluster uh, button right here. Now, this is going to go through all of those unique values, and it's going to do some work in trying to decide which values might go together. This can be really handy when you have a lot of different textual values and a lot of records to go, go through. This does a lot of the work for us. There's um, several different methods that you can use, as well as several different keying functions. Um, I'm not super familiar with what all of these mean, but you can play around and see which method gives you the best results. So we have a couple of values for St. Louis recognized here, so we'll go ahead and take advantage of those. So it's saying, okay, um, 371 records were recognized as St. Louis. And so what we can do is we can say, take these two different values, and I'm going to go ahead and go with the ST period space Lewis version of St. Louis. So I'm going to go ahead and say, merge those all together. This is going to be the new value. And I'm going to um, select merge selected and recluster. We could also merge and close or just flat out close it out if we wanted to. So I'm going to say merge selected and recluster. It's going to update all of those. It's going to go back and it's going to say no additional clusters were found. Okay. So it didn't quite catch our St. Louis and ST Louis combination, but that's okay. We can, we can handle that. We could go ahead and we could adjust this and maybe try um, try again, but for now, we're just gonna move on. I'll show you a few more ways that, you, that we can adjust these values. Okay, so going back to check on our um, unique values, we see that for St. Louis, we've got two unique values now. Um, so what we're going to do is we can um, pick one of them, I'll just say St. Louis, and then I'll click edit. And so what this is going to do is this is going to, we can interactively say, okay, take all of the values that are St. written out Lewis and change them to ST period Lewis and apply. So after we've done that, now all of our St. Louis values are aligned and we can use that same method to do uh, university city. So I've decided that what's best for my analysis is to have University City written out. So I'm going to find the U City values. I'm going to click Edit, and I'm going to ask OpenRefine 
to change all of the U city values to University City. All right. So now we're in really good shape. We've got three legitimate cities written out here. And next, we need to address our Missouri. Now, I'm not quite sure what's happening with our uh, Missouri, like maybe some values were transposed or something like that. So I'm going to, if I hover over Mo, it's a selectable link, and I'm going to go ahead and select that. And that isolates any values that are um, have a city of Mo. So if I look at this, it essentially looks like some values were transposed here. We've got a value of St. Louis in the income column, which is not entirely correct. In fact, that's flat out wrong. State looks okay, but it looks like um, Mo was entered for the city incorrectly. So from here, this is just an easy manual fix. I'm gonna go ahead and click edit next to the Mo value. And I'm going to assume that this is St. Louis and I'm just gonna cancel. Um, this zip code is a St. Louis zip code. So I'm going to manually correct that and apply. All right, just clicking on Mo again is gonna bring all of those records back. All right, so our city values look good. They're nice and clean. They're all legitimate cities. And so we're ready to move on to the next, uh, the next item here. So we saw that our income column had that value of St. Louis in there. Um, and so we know we're gonna have to correct that. Um, and there might be some other weirdness happening in our income column. So we'll take a look and see what's happening there. All right, so I'm going to click on my income column. I'm going to say facet, numeric facet. And what that is going to do is that's going to open up another um, panel here in my um, facet and filtering pane on the left. And it's going to tell me the range of values that's coming in. So essentially my values range generally from 20,000 to about a million. Most of the records are coming in as legitimate data types, uh, numeric data types, but several of them are coming in as non-numeric. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, uncheck numeric for the time being, and I'm going to take a look and see what's happening with the values that are coming in as non-numeric. All right. So um, it looks like we have several that are coming in as NA, like actual text values NA. We've got our St. Louis here, and then we also have something that's none. So I think for my analysis for this project, what would be best is if I just had null values for all of these. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to change this to nothing. And I'm going to say apply to all identical cells. So now all my cells that were NA before are now null. And I'm going to do the same thing with my um, St. Louis value. So it will actually work. And I just manually um, adjust all those values. Okay. If I turn my numeric values back on, I can see that I my all my non-numeric values have um, been changed to blank values, which is fine. That's what I want. And the rest are numeric. Now, just as a check, I might want to take a look at the min and max values. And to do that, I'm just going to do a quick sort. And I will sort these um, smallest first. And so I have my, uh, it looks like about 28,000 is my minimum value. And then if I do another sort, I could reverse. And then I've got just shy of a million as my max value. For my project, those make sense. And so I'm good to go with my, uh, with my income values. All right, so next up, we're gonna tackle the dates. And if you've worked with data at all, you know what a pain dates can be. So let's see what we can do here. So I'm going to, um, so right now the dates are coming in as text. 
So the first thing I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to do one of those common transforms to see if that can catch some of those dates and turn them into actual dates. So I'm going to go up to my date submitted column and I'm going to go to edit cells, common transforms, and then I'm going to say to date. All right. So that worked out for most of them. I can see that 1,066 cells were transformed to dates. Um, they look kind of a little strange now. Um, they're in a standardized format, um, but at least um, we're, we're looking pretty good. And now I know that if there's any applications that are going to be reading these as dates and needing to do calculations, like for example, um, determining if a date is earlier than the current date or determining the days in between um, different dates, I know that, um, that my analysis functionality will work because these are um, coming in as dates. Now, already I can see that there's a few that didn't get picked up. So let's see how we can um, adjust those. So I'm gonna go back to my date submitted. And if you haven't noticed by now, all of the actions that we're doing on all of these columns typically start with these little column dropdowns. So that's a good place to start if you're not really sure what to do. I'm going to hit this column dropdown and I'm going to go back to facet. And then this time I'm going to do a timeline facet. Okay, so my date submitted is showing down here and I can see that most of the records were coming in as legitimate date times, but I do have two that are not. Um, it's also giving me, um, similar to income, it's giving me a little histogram here, telling me how many values are coming in at a certain date. So I'm gonna uncheck time, and this is going to give me the two dates that have that weren't recognized when I tried to do that common transformation. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to make some decisions here. So for some reason, one of these dates came in as July 2019. So I think what I'm going to try to do here is I'm just going to set this to July 1st. I'll say 07, 01, 2019. And then the other one looks like it's probably just a typo. Maybe this meant to be um, February 3rd. Um, and we know it's not February 30th. So I'm going to go ahead and just set this one back to 02, 03, 2019 apply. All right, so I edited those cells. They're still coming in as text for now. So I'm going to turn my time back on. Now I'm going to go back and I'm going to do that common transform again, uh, where I go to date submitted, edit cells, common transformations to date. And so now I can see that those final two cells have been transformed into dates. And now my entire date submitted um, uh, box over here on the left side, it's not giving me the um, breakdown of the different types anymore because now they are all legitimately dates. Okay. So my data looks nice. It looks very satisfying and clean now. I love it when it looks like this. So I'm gonna go ahead and do an export. So from here, I'm gonna to go to export. And then there are a number of different options that I could use. Um, I could export it back to a Google Sheet if I wanted to. But let's say for my application, I just want a plain old CSV on my computer. So I'm gonna say comma, um, separated values. And then I'll just save that as um, STL survey cleaned. And now I'm ready to go taking this into um, whatever application I might be uh, using um, to do my analysis, or maybe I'll do some data visualization. And that, of course, is going to be dependent on your field of study and whatever it is you want to do next. So if you haven't yet worked with 
a Google, a Google collab notebook um, and you're interested in Python, I highly recommend it. It's great because it's a web-based way to interact with Python. You don't have to install anything on your machine. All you need is a Google account, which is free. Um, so um, it's a really easy entry point. So definitely check it out if you are so inclined. <clears throat> In the folder that I sent you a link to um, is this IPYMB file. So that is the file extension for a Python notebook. So what we have on screen right now is a Python notebook, just giving you a little tour of the interface here. Um, if you want to look at the, um, essentially the headings of the notebook, um, you can expand the, table of contents here. You can search your code, do a find and replace. You can, um, once we start doing uh, or assigning variables, all the variables are going to show up here. And then also if we wanna upload any files ourselves, um, we can upload them here using the file upload button. And that can be really handy. You're certainly welcome to do that. There are, again, uh, file limitations on this, and we can see that um, down here. Um, they are quite large, though, so you can go pretty far um, in these Google Notebooks. Um, for our purposes today, we're going to be bringing in that same um, CSV straight from our Google Drive. All right, so we're going to be using a URL. Also, something to note is that you can connect directly to the files on your Google Drive account. And if you scroll down to the bottom of this notebook, I give you some instructions on how to do that. All right. So um, all of this text here is just markup. Um, so if you click into the cell, you can see like how each of these text sections is set up. Um, and so we're going to have text blocks and we're also gonna have code blocks. So to run the code blocks, all you have to do is just click on the little play symbol here, and that's gonna go ahead and run the cell. If the cell runs correctly, then you'll get a little green check mark. Um, if the cell does not run co correctly, then um, the notebook will expand and you'll see an error message here. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and run the cells to import the libraries. Here we're importing pandas. And then here's the link to the data file. So again, um, I've listed all of this out for you because I wasn't anticipating having the time to actually go through it with you together. So this is designed as kind of like a self-guided tour through um, some common data cleaning steps with Python. Essentially, we're reading in our data. And then um, we can start to explore the shape. Now, see how I already have a little output here um, because this indicates that I've run the cell before. If I want to get rid of all my output so I'm running all of this fresh, I can go down here to the lower left-hand corner um, to access various code snippets or the command palette, which is really handy. So here's a bunch of different commands, um, but what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to scroll down to the clear all outputs and I'm gonna clear all my outputs. So anything that I printed out or ran before is essentially going to be go away. So we're doing it fresh here um, together in our workshop. So if I run this, this gives us the shape of our data. It's saying we have 100 or we have 1,068 rows and six columns. If we want to take a look at the first few records, we can use the head uh, property that gives us the first several records. It gives us an idea of what the values look like. Um, the data count property is going to give us how many non-null rows we have for each column. So in most cases, that's 168, but we do have some nulls for income that we looked at before. If we want to take um, a look at the data types, Oh, no, excuse me. So for the describe property, what that does is it gives us a little summary of all of the different columns. This is most useful for your numeric columns. It's going to give you the mean, the min, the max straight away. It's a little bit less useful for the textual columns because there is no mean max um, for textual columns. And just a different way to... Um, 
to isolate the um, information that comes across in the describe uh, function. All right, so what the rest of this workbook leads you through is performing some of the same analysis that we did um, or the same cleaning steps we did in Open Refine. We wanted to translate all of the zip codes to strings. We wanted all of the income values to be numeric and then also ensure that all the city names are valid and consistent. So I'm going to go ahead and pause here on the Python notebook because I also want you to at least see the um, what the POSIT cloud or the R notebook looks like. So I'm going to scroll back over to a new tab, which is my POSIT cloud tab, and I'll just click resume because um, since I had let my project go idle for a little bit, it um, just kind of put it to sleep. When you open up your um, POSIT Cloud, and again, um, so POSIT Cloud is a free platform. Um, you can sign up and get an account for free. And technically, you probably will have to sign up in order to view this link. Um, mine is connected to my GitHub account. Um, and so it's I only have one login, which is pretty handy. Um, but once you get into the workbook, you'll see that it looks really similar to our studio if you're familiar with our studio where you have your script you have your console here in the lower left your environment pane and then your files pane so i have um, this particular notebook set up as an r markdown file um, with code chunks and markup language that walks you through all the code chunks and so to see this in its notebook format you're going to click on the uh, HTML file here, and I've already done that and opened it up in my web browser, and you can see that this is a notebook very similar to the Python notebook that we were looking at before. So uh, the difference here is that we're not going to be running this code interactively. The code has technically already been run and it shows us the results. So we input the file and then as we start doing our examination of the file, um, all of those outputs are shown here. So for example, we read in the CSV, we checked out the number of rows and columns and printed those out. And then we used the head function to look at the top several rows. So all of these are going to be um, already run and showing you the output. <clears throat> okay, so thank you so much for coming and um, good luck with your research. Take care.